Hi everyone, I'm Amy from AbilityNet. I'm here with Mike Chung from UCL and Adam Tweed also from AbilityNet to talk about creating a digital pathway to support and success for international students. Well, it's fair to say that when we first planned this session, we didn't realise things were going to unfold like this, did we? Not at all. So, um, so the premise of our session relates to how you can create a feeling of welcome to international students via digital means. And with the situation this summer and the likelihood in most institutions that learning may well be taking place predominantly online in term one at least, this is ever more relevant. So Mike, would you like to talk us through your countdown to UCL, how that would traditionally play out and how it's had to change in the current context? Thanks, Amy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the countdown to UCL is a series of emails that's sent out by our development communications and projects team here in Student Support and Wellbeing. Um, it includes information for prospective students about university life, about living in London, the support services that we have on offer, amongst many other things as well. Now, this is one of sort of several messages that sent out to applicants, and it's going to need to be reworked this year due to COVID-19 and the nature of university life during the global pandemic. Um, in particular, it's going to affect anybody who's unable to get to London, especially international students and those who might feel that they're not able to get to London or not able to travel um, due to health concerns, which have been obviously heightened by COVID-19. Um, so traditionally, uh, this series of emails that we'd send to applicants would be designed to both generate excitement and also to provide some really useful information. Um, now, of course, we know that there's not going to be many international students uh, that will make it to London. So we're expecting that there will be international students that will um, stay in their home countries to study um, and that will link in remotely to teaching classes and classes online. Um, so sessions that we're delivering on campus online. Um, so our messaging across the board is going to need to shift really to reflect that. So this comes in the form of conversations with our applicants as well as any messaging that's sent out and what we display as a support service. Um, we know that there are going to be significant changes in the student experience this coming academic year um, and it's crucially important that we communicate and position ourselves to really serve our international students as best possible um, whilst they're not able to actually be in London. Yeah, that's quite a task, isn't it? Um, so, and of course, the online digital approach is going to be the main means of engagement during term one. How do you think that will be specifically for disabled students? Yeah, so I touched on this um, very briefly in the last point that um, here at UCL we're going to be aiming for a blended learning approach in term one um, and that means that all of our larger lectures they're going to be delivered online and there are going to be some smaller elements of on-campus activity as well. Um, the on-campus activity um, is obviously going to have to adhere to social distancing guidelines and any other COVID-19 related guidance that um, is relevant for the time um, but those sessions will be made available to those who can't be here remote um, on campus, so it'll be made available to them remotely too. Um, and for those students, which uh, we expect to be um, a large number of international students with disabilities, their sole engagement will definitely be online. Um, so I think different groups of students are going to have different challenges with remote engagement. Um, and we know that there are definitely some benefits to online modes of teaching. Um, there are so many inbuilt tools in so many of the platforms that really help sessions to become more accessible, and that's great. Um, this coming academic year, we know that students all over the world are going to need to have the means to participate and engage with online teaching, with online events. Um, and whilst the added accessibility features um, of these platforms will be a massive bonus, uh, we know too that there will be students that will face significant challenges with this form of teaching and this form of learning online. Um, so when specifically thinking about disabled students in this context, I think it's really important to consider the equipment that they'll have available. Um, this can vary depending on their background, depending on the part of the world that they live in. Um, I think it's crucial to consider how they're going to engage where there are additional accessibility needs. Um, particularly when it comes to assistive technology. 
how are we going to ensure that they're able to access all that they need to and have all the tools that they that they need to be able to learn effectively uh, there are some really great solutions out there um, but they need to be considered at an early stage in order for us to be prepared and ready for the start of term um, every year at ucl we consider what we need in terms of loan equipment and software and we tend to do that over the summertime um, right. this year isn't going to be any different in terms of planning for that uh, but now we've got the added consideration that students aren't going to be here in London to receive what we have to offer. Uh, we've got a suite of computers in what we call the Digital Accessibility Hub at UCL, um, where students can go to access and try software. We've got network software, um, we've got software and equipment that we provide to students um, through our services. And we really have to think carefully about how those services are going to work alongside each other. Um, how they'll work remotely, what we can do, what we can't do effectively, um, and how we ensure that students have the support that they need, both in terms of non-medical help and technology, to be able to thrive at university while studying remotely. So that's going to be a bit of a logistical uh, conundrum over the summer for you. Um, good luck with that. And, and it, it sounds like a, it's a sensible move to be thinking about this really early. Definitely. Um, so just going over to Adam, are there some technologies and features that you can recommend that could help um, on the uh, online engagement side of things? Well, I mean, essentially, yes, there are. There are lots. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure many of you have asked in the, these kind of moments of pause that we've had, how on earth would we have managed this 10 years ago or maybe even five years ago? Um, technology, the internet, cloud computing, the move away from the on-premises service, uh, um, services and servers support, that sort of thing, have meant that the announcement of lockdown, um, many of us were able to provide a good enough continuation of service, be that in business or in academia. It's forced us to explore delivering content in different ways, and we're increasingly aware of the opportunities this has opened up as well. So the other day I received a, an email from a meetup, an accessibility meetup that was taking place in Berlin. It was the Berlin group, and it was something I'd never been able to consider on a whim before lockdown, but I was able to just join that up because it's delivered online. Um, but we've also, as, as Mike said, we've, we've seen how vital internet access is and it needs to be stable, fast internet access and how disabling it can be when you're the one on the call with the connectivity problems or with the problematic computer or with the neighbor with the lawnmower and too much free time. You know? <laughs> um, so in terms of top tips, it's difficult um, as companies innovate and it's become almost the, the kind of the great arms race to be the platform of choice for, for online delivery. There was a story recently of a, a Microsoft executive um, in a fairly public Microsoft Teams call um, being interrupted by his son who said it was really cool that his dad was using Zoom and that <laughs> cringeworthy moment. <laughs> um, but the point is that choosing a method of delivery um, often involves an internal policy or a lot of trial and error. And as platforms vary, features vary, and users vary, and you're never going to suit everyone. But I guess number one is subtitles by default. Um, Google Slides have simple captions. Uh, it's a simple captions option and a reasonable accuracy. You're talking about maybe 75% accuracy at the moment. And if you think stenographers are probably around 85 to 90%. And if there are any watching who are saying, hang on a second, it's higher than that, then I do apologize. Um, but I will just give you a very quick um, demo of the Google Slides captioning, just to show you how um, simple it is to switch on. So we just have captions, we flick them on, and you should see them starting at the bottom of my screen. Now the option with Google is that you can then flick these to position them at the top of the screen. So that's quite good if you're delivering and you've got content running along the bottom, or when we do go back to physical classes to have the, the um, classes running there. As you can see, it's reasonably accurate, but I should caveat that um, regional accents can reduce this simply because of the data set the model has been trained on. So they're very good at kind of the Caucasian middle class received pronunciation. Um, but when you move into regional accents, you, you start getting um, 
more and more, but in terms of the, the data set that models are trained on, that's a completely uh, different webinar. But I'd love to go into that at some point and how unfair it can be. Um, so that's the Google captions. Just stop sharing for a second. And then we have, so that's Google's version. Microsoft have their own um, presentation in PowerPoint. And that takes subtitling to a completely another level. Um, it allows you to live subtitle, but it also leverages Microsoft Translator to allow users to scan a QR code and then get live subtitles in their preferred language on their device. Brilliant. Again, for the Berlin meetup that I was at, it would have been fantastic if I could have joined as an English participant with a multinational group speaking their own languages. It turned out everybody defaulted to English, which was a little bit kind of embarrassing, but you know, it's it's lovely to have that tool available. And they've also taken this further with a thing called live presentations. And I'm going to talk over this bit um, just to kind of introduce it. It does have its own um, soundtrack, but I thought it would be best to see if I could introduce it. So again, I'm going to mute mine because that's going to confuse me. So you get a QR code or a URL to scan. It then opens up functionality, additional functionality in the presentation. It allows you to flick back through the slides that have already been or skip forward to the slide that is currently being presented. It'll present the subtitles again in a language of choice. And this one's just a flip around to show that the person speaking there was speaking in Spanish. It'll give you the number of people who have joined the session and it will also allow for live feedback. So these are the kind of emoji based reactions to the content that you're presenting. And at the end of it, it gives you a presentation score. Some interesting content, um, the overall kind of scoring there, the emoticons that you've received um, and some general areas of improvement. Um, and some nice little comments. So that's the live presentations currently available in PowerPoint. Ooh. Wow, that's great. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an amazing, it's amazing service. I should say I haven't messed around with it enough to know whether you can switch off the um, the live feedback because I know for somebody like me, if I was watching feedback coming in, that would completely <laughs> throw me. But actually, the, the feedback at the end, the summary feedback, would be incredibly right. useful. Um, yep. So, of course, um, turning on and off captions currently relies on the presenter. Microsoft Teams, as a meeting platform, gives this option to the participant in a Teams meeting. Um, but there's a new product. It's currently in beta. It's called Captioned or Captioned.ed. Um, and this will provide functionality across products, uh, including as a browser extension. So again, this gives the user the choice to switch on captioning um, for any content that they're watching. It doesn't have, as, I'm, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't yet have translation of language. But right. if you're thinking about old content, stuff that you haven't been able to caption, it will be able, you'd be able to have that with the user still in control of providing those um, captions for themselves. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean, the shift to online is meant presenting to a laptop rather than a sea of faces, uh, and this may be significantly more comfortable for people like me. Um, but for those more used to delivering lecture content, on the online delivery often lacks feedback. You can't tell whether somebody's checking their email or has wandered off to make a cup of tea, or if 90% of your audience are scratching their heads and looking puzzled. So my second point is around this feedback. And as I said, you might not like the ever-present kind of uh, live feedback presented by the, the um, live presentations, um, but it is important to be able to gauge audience reaction uh, and give an opportunity to ask questions or to see if things are sinking in. And again, there's a split and variation between tools and platforms. I did have a demo, I'm conscious of time, so I'm just gonna very quickly run through the options that you've got. So Zoom, for example, has the online polling features um, as well as a Q&A pane. And it's useful to use the Q&A pane because that gives you the option to review stuff afterwards. So if you wanna follow up with people, if you realize that there were questions you weren't able to, to answer during the, the webinar itself, Google Slides, again, has a similar Q&A feature and it allows 
users to post questions via a link and there is an option to post anonymously. Now that's incredibly important for those of us who might actually be the ones in the crowd who don't like putting their hand up, who don't, who aren't necessarily comfortable with admitting a level of ignorance to something that they think they should know. Um, so fantastic universal feature there. Uh, and then there's Mentimeter as well. Um, so that that's a, a nice kind of visual representation of feedback that you can intersperse your presentations with. So it's often best to pose a question or gauge a confidence level on a topic before you begin and then to kind of punctuate your presentation with points of feedback throughout. Um, so and then the the last point is essentially that the Q&A the chat in larger groups can be a bit ungainly. So it's it's probably a good idea to to have somebody available to be doing the curation of the, the Q&A and then following up with you as a single kind of point of contact afterwards. Yeah, it's a really, really rare skill to be able to present mm. and manage the Q&A without getting thrown. So I think that's a really, really sensible suggestion as well. Oh, wow. No, um, lots of really um, useful thoughts in here. And I love the idea of the Mentimeter because, you know, if um, if a poll goes up and everyone's saying they don't have a high level of understanding of an area, then those shy people are perhaps a bit happier to ask questions as well. Wow. Yeah, OK. Absolutely. So um, going back to yourself, Mike, when you look over the last few months, What's your view on how the experience has been for disabled international students studying online? Well, thankfully at UCL so far, um, we haven't had many disabled international students flagging up big issues with us with studying online. Um, of course, there are cases, uh, but it hasn't been a really big issue for us so far. Um, one thing that we know has worked really well in our service is the engagement with non-medical help. So right. we're lucky to have uh, some really amazing study skills tutors and mentors that work in our in-house provision. Um, and they've been a real key link to many students at UCL with disabilities. We have found that sessions, um, they haven't solely been based around academics, although of course that forms the bulk of what's being discussed on most occasions. Um, but they've also been really useful as a means of students staying in contact with our service quite regularly. So students on the whole have been really receptive. Um, they've been happy to be engaged and uh, just simply talking about how they're doing. Um, I think this is going to be so important when we're moving forward throughout term one um, when considering how we support students remotely, because the temptation is always going to be for an in-house service to prioritise students that receive DSA. Uh, and that's because there's money involved. Um, but that said, for disabled international students who aren't going to meet anyone on their course in person, um, who may feel disconnected from the university as a whole, who won't even be in the same country, um, who might be struggling with more than just a disconnect, but with managing their disability too. Um, this could be a real game changer for them. Um, and that's not to say that our disabled support services um, should all switch to becoming solely wellbeing focused services. You know, each service has its role and it's of course really important that they function in those ways. Um, but what I'm saying is that there is real added value in that regular contact with disabled international students and that definitely shouldn't be overlooked. That's a really, really good point because the, the isolation of not being part of, you know, the whole student uh, on campus experience coupled with, you know, particularly the, the international students who are in their first year, this is going to be quite key for them to start building relationships and feeling a part of things at UCL. Absolutely, yeah, I totally agree. Brilliant, okay. So, um, Adam, you've been doing um, some needs assessments online for DSA, but also for international students. Can you tell us how that's been working out? Yeah, I mean, the switch to online was relatively straightforward for us. We would um, had them available as, as uh, an option for our workplace assessments uh, for some time. And at the beginning of the year, we were mid midway through a pilot um, with non-DSA international students. Um, the switch, as far as students were concerned, they were completely unfazed. Um, <laughs> there was the odd <laughs> dressing gown assessment, I have to admit. Um, that's the student. 
I stress so it's not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> um, but essentially it meant that, there, that things like the barriers of travel were no longer an issue. Um, and, you know, the, the getting up and, and you know, the, eating into a day, these sorts of problems that we do, we do sometimes see with students. But I mean, in terms of the, the barriers to travel that I had um, this kind of taken to an extreme um, as I carried out uh, an assessment with a student who was in Peru. Um, mm. The university had said that they would post software and small equipment, uh, but actually even this was unnecessary. She, she had a laptop, she had decent headphones, um, so decent enough microphone. So I was able during the assessment to point her towards the inbuilt um, Microsoft tools like dictation um, that she was able to use pretty much the moment I stopped the, the assessment you know, right there and then. But it yeah. gave her the, the bridge for the specialist software. So I, I said, you know, I, I um, recommended a Dragon software to be provided. Um, but even that, it was something that could be installed remotely. So she was able to have that as soon as it was cleared. A few days later, she was using the, the Dragon software as she had been at her university because they had the assistive technology uh, like UCL, they have them, them in the suites and yeah, and training as well was carried out via video conference. So it, it yeah, seamless and a really, a really positive experience, certainly from from our end. Brilliant. Um, so Mike, when it comes to managing reasonable adjustments remotely, do you have any views on how best to manage this for international students? Yeah, it's a great question, Amy. Um, I think it's important that we really take the time to really understand the challenges that disabled international students are going to face when studying remotely. Um, when it comes to academics, of course, we need to tailor our reasonable adjustments to that method of teaching, to online teaching. Um, yeah. Ensuring that videos are captioned, sessions are recorded, all texts are made available in accessible formats and things like that. Um, of course, a lot of these standards are, are things that we'd expect on campus too. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there needs to be an extra consideration to how a disabled international student might engage with their course and with their peers as well. Um, at a university as large as UCL, it becomes quite tricky um, as different departments and subject areas are invariably going to differ in terms of their approaches to teaching. Um, and they've got very different requirements in, in the things that they need to teach and their course content. Um, but increased communication with departments from central services like ours can really make a big difference here. Most departments really want to help and most departments really want to do right by the students and that increased communication from our service will definitely help. Of course, sometimes it takes a student to flag to us that there's an issue first, but again, it's about communication. and It's about letting those students know that we're here to help when they need us. This primarily comes through messaging at the start of session um, and throughout the academic year as well. So when it comes to things such as note taking, BSL, non-medical help in general, we know that these methods of support can work really well remotely and, and that's been demonstrated in term three when we've had to do online teaching. And here I think the key is going to be for term one in engaging with suppliers and with the academic departments at a really early stage to ensure that everything's in place, that those support workers have access to the materials and that they need to provide, um, they have what they need to provide the support effectively. Ultimately, I think it's, it's really vitally important for us to consider all the different angles. I know that as disability practitioners, we do this all the time anyway, but when it comes to what we provide to disabled students that are obviously not DSA eligible, that are studying in a different country, I think we just need to be more aware of the difficulties that they might encounter, not only in the day to day teaching, but also in the tasks across their time with us. You know, we shouldn't overlook things such as enrollment, for example. Good point. Um, not all of these areas are going to be within, within our remit, but it's about working with others across the university. So, for example, I've had meetings and conversations with our information services division um, about the student system about start of session plans and the considerations that need to be made for disabled students in these areas. And it's things like this that are considered and undertaken now in the early summertime, that's really going to make the difference when we get to September. Our service has also been engaging with colleagues across the university to discuss disabled student experience um, and have been feeding into several different work streams, which is great as it means that 
students with disabilities are being taken into account when it comes to planning for the new academic year. Um, I'm not sure if the same is the case in, in other institutions as well, and if it is, then that's brilliant. But if not, then I definitely urge disability services to try to become more a part of the conversation, to reach out and to engage with the discussions that are happening across uh, different universities. Um, I really do think that it's the thought, the, the work, the plans, and all of the consideration that we put in at this stage right now that will ensure that disabled international students are supported really well from the start of term one. Um, and that's not only in reasonable adjustments and in non-medical help support, but also in their university-wide experience too. Definitely. So what I'm taking away from this whole discussion is that, you know, preparation, planning and communication is absolutely key and also grabbing the digital tools that are available and not being afraid to take a few risks and, um, you know, try a few things to gauge what works and, and just keep talking to students and staff to, um, you know, to, to take that forward and improve the experience. Um, OK, well, thank you. I think our uh, our time is up and we're probably going over to Q&A now. So um, thank you very much, um, Adam and Mike. And I'm, I'm sure there'll be some questions from our audience. Thank you. Thank you.